copy of God's Word this morning. Open it up to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, we're going to begin reading in verse 35. Mark chapter 10 and verse 35. As we consider God's timeless Word in a new year, what He would have us to believe and do and act on in 2017. Mark chapter 10 and beginning in verse 35. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. He said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? They said to him, we are able. Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must first be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is traveling with his disciples along the road back to Zion, to Jerusalem. And along the way, James and John, the brothers, sons of Zebedee, two of the three closest to Jesus, along with Peter, come up to him and they say to him in verse 35, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Wouldn't that be nice? God, grant my every request. Lord, give us whatever we want. Jesus responds in verse 36, What do you want me to do for you? And Here's what they ask. Grant us to sit, one at your right hand, one at your left, in your glory. As you know, the right hand was considered the place of honor in Jewish culture and custom. So clearly, they're jockeying for position here because we know that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And this isn't the first time they've had this argument. In chapter 9, James and John have come up to want to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus has given basically this same speech. And it's really a selfish request on their part. But it reveals how human beings view greatness compared to how God views greatness. Greeks and the Romans lived for this stuff. You know what this is like. If your favorite sports team wins, you're on your feet. Throw in a parade, celebrating. I remember very clearly winning the math contest in first grade over all the other students. I had the Wheel of Fortune theme playing in the background of my mind as I received that award. All you other guys have gotten beat. These disciples are asking for the place of honor. They're asking for recognition, but what they don't realize is that Jesus isn't leading a victory parade, but a death park. And they're fighting over who gets to be the line leader. And so Jesus responds to their request in verse 38. And he says, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? He's talking about his suffering and death, his passion, his crucifixion. And they said to him rather naively, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Jesus tells them, if you want to share in my kingdom, you must first share in my suffering. For the record, he's not the one who hands out and arranges the seating charts. So when the other ten disciples hear this, they begin to be indignant at James and John. Wouldn't you be? 
By the way, these guys fighting over greatness, who sits at the right and left hand, who's going to be in the proper place in line on the march back to Jerusalem. These are the guys that God uses to turn the world upside down. You can use any of us. And Jesus calls them and says to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. He says, this is what the pagans do. You must be different. So he says, it shall not be so among you, but whosoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whosoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. To give his life as a ransom for many. This Jesus, who deserves all the honor, all the glory, all the fame, lays it all down in order that he might serve. The one who is rich becomes poor. The one who is great becomes small. The one who is infinite becomes finite. And he does it so that you and I might have life. I'm convinced that the danger the disciples face in this passage is really the danger that many churches face today. When we begin to play the comparison game, who has the biggest church? Who has the best buildings? Who has the most money? Who has the best preaching? Who has the best music? Who has the best programs? And we start to compete with one another basically over other people's sheep. And if we're not careful... We get in the same place as the disciples for seeking to have the greatest church when Jesus says the greatest among you must first be a servant unto all. I heard something a while back that's really stuck with me more recently. And it was an admonition to, to churches everywhere, really to pastors. They said this, stop trying to be the best church in your community and start trying to be the best church or your community. I think there's a lot of truth in that. Sometimes you'll see churches copy other people's programs, other people's ideas. Well, if they can do that, we can do that too. When really what God has called us to do is to see and to look and to observe the places where we can serve. He says, it's not unto us, O Lord, but unto your name that we're to give praise. The one God most honors are those who seek to serve. You know, we spent a lot of time building a multi-purpose building. I'm thankful for that. There were some students in here last week playing basketball over Christmas and New Year's break whose parents, as far as I know, are not affiliated with any part of our church or not active in church, but were here and heard the gospel from Mark before they played basketball. I'm thankful that we're able to do that. I'm thankful that we're able to be a blessing to people across the river in Indiana where some of us have jobs, some of us live, some of us shop and go to the restaurants just as they've been a blessing to us. And that way we're able to be a blessing to them by offering a like-minded church in faith and, and, and practice. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the way that we give, for the amount of the debt that has been retired, the way that we give towards missions and Lottie Moon and all the things that God has done. I'm thankful for the people who, who have come over the last few years. And some of them God has, has moved along to other places, but we're thankful for whatever He has done in their lives. But I, I really want to see if this year can't be the year that we really seek to love and to bless our community. You know, part of our, our mission statement that we talk about that's, that's not unique just to one ministry, but it's unique to the DNA of our church is engaging the world through ministry. And really what that is talking about is what we're doing outside the walls of the church. I'm not talking about starting another program or, or starting some other thing that we have to schedule and advertise. I'm talking about what does it mean to meet people's needs in everyday life in your neighborhood and in your community? What if we said... People from five different counties that attend this church every Sunday. What if we said we will love the community in which God has called us to live and we will serve it? We'll do it in Hancock County. We'll do it in Perry County. We'll do it wherever God has called us to live. And we'll communicate to them that by our actions, God has called us to love you. 
I want you to think about gospel impact and some tangible ways in which that could happen. Listen, when Windward Heights residents don't have clean water, what's to stop us from taking them some water and offering it to them in Jesus' name? We've got business cards outside of our exits that have the service times schedule on it. What's to stop you from every once in a while going through a fast food line, not knowing the person behind you, and going up to the window and saying, I'd like to pay for this person behind me, give them this card, and say, God loves them, and so do we, over at this congregation. You say, well, that'd bankrupt me if I do it every day. What if you did it once a year? Twice a year, quarterly, monthly, weekly. Some of you have bought my meals being in line. What if you did that for a random person you didn't even know? Show them that somebody in this world cares about them because God cares about them. What, what's keeping us from doing worthwhile projects in our communities based through our Sunday school classes and other ministries, just seeing where the needs are? You know, something about Jesus that he, he never says in the gospel, he never tells the world to go to church. He tells the church to go to the world. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Show God's love so that you might share God's love. What if we said to this community, you may never set foot in our doors, but we want to bless you because God has blessed us. Folks, has God blessed you? Let me say that again. Has God blessed you? Now, I'm not talking about the stuff that we have or the, the possessions or the, the homes that we own. All that is good. I'm talking about forgiveness and grace and mercy and pardon that He has given to us who do not deserve it. And because God has blessed us, we bless others. Because God has given to us, we serve others. Because God has loved us, we turn around and love others. We serve a God whose greatest act was to give Himself for other people. Can we do anything less? Unless you think that I've got some type of grand plan with a strategy and a schedule in mind, I don't. It's going to have to be more of a grassroots operation. I just believe that if we can get people worshiping God in His Word, in His house, then if we can get people in Sunday school classes to small groups so that they can grow in their faith and develop Christian friendships and accountability and be there for one another, to bear one another's burdens, and then if we can get outside the walls and show God's love in order to share God's love, then we're doing the two things that God has called us to do through the great commandment, love your God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself, and the great commission, going to share, fulfilling those two things. And I'll tell you this, this church throughout its history has always been at its best when we're about others. We're not here to serve ourselves. We're not here to make this a better place for us. Yes, we bear one another's burdens. Yes, we come together corporately to worship, but we don't come to church. You understand that? We are the church. The church gathers to worship. But wherever we are, we are the church. And when we stop thinking, about how we can bless ourselves and start thinking about how we can bless others. Saying to the world, it's not about you, it's not about us. We don't exist for ourselves, we exist for others. What a difference that could make. And so I just want to ask you open-endedly, how can we serve our communities? I mean that. I want you to think about it. I want you to pray about it. And then when you come back, next week or the week after that or whenever, I want you to let us know. Send us an email. Fill out a communication card. Say something. Two caveats here. Understand there will be a lot of great suggestions and a lot of good things that we could do, but there's no way we'll be able to do everything. We'll have to prayerfully select through that, so we can't do everything. We can do something. And then number two, I would ask that every person in this room be all in. This can't be something that should be staff-led or deacon-led or Sunday school teacher-led. This has got to be all of us. Saying we, we want to show the same love that God has shown to us, and there's no strings attached. Just blessing. Just loving. Just serving other people. Not charity. Because it's about more than charity. Charity's good. This is more than that. 
Not judging, because it's about more than condemnation. We, we don't do good works simply to do good works. Because when you take God out of good works, you're missing the whole point of good works. New York Times ran an article this past Friday talking about a pastor by the name of Bart Campolo, who was the, the son of Tony Campolo, a famous evangelist in the 1980s and 90s, who has forsaken the Christian faith but has not forsaken good works. And so he's what he calls himself a secular humanist. He does things for the sake of love. He doesn't believe in the resurrection, doesn't believe in the miraculous, doesn't believe in the things of the divine, but does good simply so that good can be done and so that hopefully people will have a better journey through life because this life, he believes, is all there is. Ladies and gentlemen, the good works that we profess are only because of the faith that we possess. And our good works are not in order that we might be saved, but because we are saved. I attended the funeral yesterday of a precious family member, several in this church, into that service, this gospel had been proclaimed. Several people broke down, knowing that on the earthly side, they would see their loved one no more. I cannot imagine saying to someone as a pastor, this life is all there is. You will not see them again. Brothers and sisters, if this life is all there is, Paul says it very well, you are of all people most miserable we believe something more than that, don't we? We believe in the miraculous. We believe that lame men walk, and we believe that blind eyes see, and we believe that dead bones come alive. And when the world tells you to believe in everything and everyone, we believe in the only one, and His name is Jesus Christ. And when everyone out there is seeking an answer or a purpose or a fulfillment, we know His name. We've just got to share it with them. Everything that we do, whether we teach a class, whether we greet, whether we serve as an usher, whether we serve in children or student ministry, what, whatever it may be, we ought to begin it every time with the prayer, God, I'm here to serve in the name of Jesus. And we have to be careful that our hearts don't become so cynical and hardened that we ignore the people that Jesus places right in front of us because who knows that the people that annoy you and get on your nerves and frustrate you are now the very people that God has placed in your life so that you can glorify Him. That in showing God's love, we might share God's love. That in caring for others, we serve the Lord. D.L. Moody, the famous evangelist, had a world-renowned Sunday school in Chicago, the 1800s. He says his original goal as a shoe salesman before he became a believer was to sell a million shoes. He went from, after his conversion, seeking to sell a, a million shoes to win a million souls to Christ. God used him in a great way. He really had a special impact on children. One day, one of the people noticed that this young boy was going way across town in order to get to, to Moody's church and his Sunday school. And the, young, the guy asked him, he said, young man, you travel all across town. It takes you forever to get there. There are plenty of churches along the way. He said, what, well, why do you go all that way? He said it pretty simply. He said, they love a fellow over there. Ladies and gentlemen, whatever we do, I pray that when we go outside these doors and when people walk in these doors, they might say we love them and we welcome them. God has loved and welcomed us. And 40 years from now, hundred years from now, when all of us except Thelma are dead and gone, may they be able to say that when people from Hallsville Baptist Church contacted me, they loved me. And I knew that their faith was real. God grant in 2017 that this community will know and sense the love of God. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching the sermon video today. If you found it helpful, would you consider sharing it with a family member or a friend? That would help us to spread this ministry and get the gospel to the ends of the earth. You can also find more information on our website, berryefields.com. Again, thanks for watching.